Also known as the nemesis of the gods, the dark lady, the queen of chaos, the undying queen, the bane of Bahamut and the avaricious, Tiamat is the legendary queen of evil dragons. Her followers seek to overthrow all other gods and towards that end they acquire as much wealth and magic as they can accumulate. Tiamat is one of the most famous villains in all of Dungeons and Dragons, to the point where most people who play the game know who she is. If dragons are the coolest and most powerful and most famous group of monsters that an adventurer can fight, then the queen of all evil dragons would have to be the final archetypal villain of D&D. But as much as she is famous, as much as we might think we know about this monster, the reality is that we don't really know anything, and her very existence is rife with questions. Is she really the creator of all evil dragons? How powerful is she? Where does she live? What does she do all day? If Tiamat wanted to amass an army, how big would that army be? How many avatars does she have? We dealt with her at the end of the adventure Rise of Tiamat, so what really happened to her? Is she dead? Is she a goddess or is she just a legendary, really powerful monster? Can she answer prayers? Do clerics of Tiamat get spells? Today we're going to answer all of these questions and more on probably the biggest video that I have made in D&D. But first, this enormous video was made possible thanks to our sponsor today, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends is a turn-based RPG set in a high fantasy world with elves, dwarves, orcs, and dragons. They even have the lizard folk. The game is about making your team in order to overcome challenges, and these challenges come in the form of a campaign, dungeons, and even PvP. The way you go about making your team is simple. You play using your starting group, you get shards, and then you use those shards to summon new monsters into your roster. There is an incredibly large number of creatures and heroes that you can use which makes team building strategic and fun. My favorite part are the tribes. It hits that RPG bone in my body and I love it. Particularly my favorite are the skinwalkers. You get minotaurs, werewolves, pigmen and enormous bipedal polar bears. I mean what is this? This is like a buffed up wendigo. I love it. If all of this sounds awesome make sure to go into the video description and download the game using my referral link. Doing this will give you 50,000 silver coins that will get you on your way to building the that great skinwalker team. Best part is, once again, if you use my referral link, you will also get a free epic champion. You will find these free goodies upon your account creation on the inbox on the top right corner. Raid is free to play and is available for both mobile and PC, so there's nothing stopping you. If you download the game using my link and play through at least a tutorial, I will have a special thank you for you on my next video, plus I will have an even more special thank you for the top 10 players who play the most with a new account they made using my referral link. I appreciate all the support guys, thank you so much for helping, let's hopefully reach that goal in the video description. Now to reward you guys for your help, here goes 40 minutes of nerding out about Tiamat. Whew, okay, so first, before we do anything else, let's describe Tiamat proper, and for this we're going to use the article on Tiamat in Polyhedron number 73. Quote, the great dragon looks like a nightmare creation sporting the necks and heads of white, black, green, blue, and red great worms. While the mass of huge heads seem to move independently like a group of writhing snakes, they are directed by one intelligence lodged deeply inside the dragon's massive body. Tiamat's five heads join just above the massive muscular shoulders. The colors of the necks and heads blend at the base in a swirl of colors that quickly turns yet black just below the shoulders. The black scales are small for a dragon of this size, about the size of a man's fist, and they gleam like ebony pearls. The great dragon's belly is blue tinged with black and her long razor sharp talons are ruby red. Tiamat's great tail, nearly twice as long as her body from chest to haunches, seem to shift in hue as it twitches from emerald green to midnight black to sapphire blue. The queen's legs are as thick as great trees, and her wings, black on the exterior and red as blood on the underside, are huge. Still, they are not powerful enough to lift her great bulk with ease. Tiamat flies magically. The wings simply aid her in maneuverability. 
Tiamat's teeth in her five heads are an opal white, sharp and long, and when the queen opens her mouths, the air seems to smell of brimstone and sulfur." End quote. What you see here is a true chromatic dragon, a dragon that comprises multiple colors, and further, a dragon that represents every single evil dragon type. Though it actually goes further than that, at least further than what it seems. One thing that many descriptions miss, and most people don't actually know, is that Tiamat actually has the tail of a wyvern. If you guys haven't seen my video on wyverns, then you might not know that wyverns were seen as possibly being some of the first types of dragons ever made. Their history is important in the overall history of dragons, even though now they are barely even considered dragons anymore. But regardless, Tiamat possesses a very powerful and very poisonous wyvern tail that she uses in combat. And this is important because in the lore it is described that Tiamat has a very, very difficult time using her claws to attack whilst she is on the ground. And so the tail becomes her main de facto way of dealing with enemies when her mouths are busy. Now, you would be surprised, her level of chromaticness it goes even farther than that. See, I bet you didn't know this, Tiamat can actually manifest more colors in her form than just a standard 5 color array that most people are used to. According to Powers and Pantheons, the only rules that Tiamat has to abide by when she creates avatars is, quote, as long as there are no more than five total, each head's colors and powers are unique, and each corresponds to an evil chromatic dragon species found in the realms." End quote. That means that Tiamat can have any number of heads as long as it doesn't surpass five. She also cannot have multiples of the same color, so she wouldn't just fill up her five heads with red dragon heads. And lastly, the colors that she chooses must represent an actual evil chromatic dragon species. You have to remember that they're actually more than just the normal black, blue, red, white, and green. You also have brown dragons, purple dragons, gray dragons, and yellow dragons. All of which she could potentially use in her avatar form. Of course, as you can imagine, switching and changing her colors would grant her benefits depending on which head she's using. Uh, she wouldn't get resistances to cold damage if she was not using a white dragon head, for example. So you can argue that there's actually a little bit of strategy involved in which heads she brings into battle. But yeah, for the longest time, for about 2,000 years, she actually presented herself in Faerun as a three-headed dragon. That was just her preferred avatar form. And then after a while, she merely assumed a single-headed red dragon form. See, before the time of troubles, a, a god could really just take whatever form they wanted as their avatar with rarely much of a restriction. She does have more forms, but we will cover them later as they become important. But yeah, this is her normal form and her favorite avatar persona. You probably already know a lot about this otherwise though. Tiamat can use every single head to breathe this corresponding elemental breath. All the heads can act on their own, but in the end they are all part of a single mind that controls them all in the middle of the body. It is interesting though that according to Polyhedron number 73, no living mortal has ever survived the five head breath attack from her real body. But okay, let's actually go a little bit deeper. We now know what Tiamat is, like physically, but what really is she? She looks like she's the only multi-headed dragon of this type in existence, but is that actually true? Is she a unique goddess or merely a unique legendary monster? Man, even the short answer to this question is tricky because it is kind of both. See, when a god has a baby, that baby is not inherently a deity. Titans or Empyreans, which are the traditional offspring of the gods, are not necessarily gods themselves even though they do possess something close to godly power. Tiamat and Bahamut are both the offspring of Io, also known as Asgorath. Now, there is debate on whether Asgoreth was a deity or a primordial, but that's beside the point. Tiamat didn't start as a deity, but merely as a legendary unique spawn of Asgoreth. Now, some legends say that she, alongside Bahamut, were the firstborn of this god, which would explain why she is so special and unique. But regardless, being so powerful and so unique, and being probably the firstborn, made all of the other evil dragons rally onto her and venerate her, which then granted her the power of a deity. Now, I do 
want you to keep in mind that there is nothing more debated and less understood than the beginnings of dragons in Dungeons and Dragons. Every race has its own myths and legends and one can't really grab truth from falsehoods. In the book Divine Power we're told that Tiamat and Bahamut came out from the shattered body of Asgarath when he was killed in the War of Creation. In the Draconomicon of 2nd edition we're told that evil dragon religion, so like what red dragons believe, is that Asgarath was really Tiamat. That it was Tiamat who originally bled and from her blood came all the chromatic dragons except for one, Bahamut. That he, as a renegade being different from the rest, wanted to create more of his kind so he followed the same ritual that Tiamat did and bled as well, creating more of his kind. But then we get a different legend from the book Races of Creation. We are told that Dragonborn believed that Asgorath purposefully gave birth to both Bahamut and Tiamat at the same time because he could not continue all the best attributes of himself in a single creation. So his plan was that he would share his best attributes in two different beings, and then have those beings reproduce in order to create the perfect baby dragons. The problem was that Tiamat and Bahamut were too different and they hated each other, so the plan didn't work. But if at any point in time Bahamut and Tiamat were to reproduce, and then you would truly see possibly a true perfect being. So as you can see, nobody really knows what the truth is. The, the fact of the matter is, and what is important here, is that Tiamat is currently, as of today, a deity, and that is the case because she is venerated enough to become one. Tiamat is also known as a multi-spheric deity, which means she is venerated in more than just one world. So if she were to be fully killed in one world, she would still live in others. Killing her in a world would merely prevent her from projecting herself and or giving spells in in that world. But let's bring it back a bit. Just because she is a unique deity doesn't mean that she is not also a unique monster. What exactly is this multi-headed chromatic style of dragon? What you will find very interesting is that according to Dragon Magazine at number 75, Tiamat can actually give birth to not just fully chromatic dragons like herself, but also multi-headed dragons. For reasons that are unknown, though probably to safeguard her power and uniqueness, she eats these babies and never lets them grow. And this is why you never see creatures that look like Tiamat simply roaming around, though again, I guess it does mean that it is not impossible. The one type of monster though that you will see roaming around that you could argue does look like Tiamat somewhat are what we call Draco Hydras. You can find these guys on the Draconomicon of 2nd edition, though as much as they might look like something that Tiamat would have created, they're fairly different. For one, they, they do have the breath weapon of a black dragon, but they instead are muddy brown in color and possess the intelligence and temperament of a white dragon. Nobody knows the, the nature of their creation, whether they are some form of proto-dragon from back in the day or whether Tiamat actually created them or maybe some other entity. Though based on the lore, they don't seem to be that directly connected to Tiamat. What it does though is it does gives us at least a measure of fear of what truly could happen if Tiamat decided to let live her monstrous multi headed chromatic creations that she gives birth to every once in a while. Okay, so now we know what she is, but where is she? And this is another interesting dilemma that many people have, because throughout the editions we have gotten multiple different answers. In Fates and Pantheons we were told that she had a realm in Heliopolis, where the Mulhorandi Pantheon resides. In the Player's Guide to Faerun, we were told that she had a realm in Dragon Eyrie, which is the home of the traditional Draconic Pantheon. And then in the Forgotten Realms Campaign Guide, we were told that she had a realm in Banehold, and further, we were told that she was serving Bane in there. Now, of course, we are also told multiple times throughout the editions that she is in Avernus, in the first layer of Hell. In the 5th edition adventure, Horde of the Dragon Queen and Rise of Tiamat, we're told that Tiamat is attempting to break the shackles that bind her in Hell, and so she seeks to enter the Prime Material Realm, so of course, the assumption there would be that she is a prisoner in Hell. But the problem is that we're one day told that she rules the first layer of Hell, and then the next day we're told that she doesn't. We're told that she has a grand dominion in Hell, but then the next day we're told that she's a prisoner. Further, you pursue presumably kill Tiamat in Rise of Tiamat, but then the question is, is she actually dead? 
<laughs> what is going on? According to Ed Greenwood, the creator of the Forgotten Realms world, Tiamat has been in Avernus the whole time and has never actually left. Every single mention of her being somewhere else has merely been either a diversion or a ruse in order to make people believe that she is grander than what she might actually be. See, Tiamat is very, very, very old, and without the, the powers granted to her by being a deity, her body would eventually deteriorate. She is, for all intents and purposes, immortal, but her regeneration has slowed down throughout the many, many ages, and this has afflicted her with internal aches and pains. All these ruses that she had for all the different places that she allegedly ruled over, except for the Banehold one, which we will talk about in a bit, were created in order to seduce a different group of people into venerating her. She wanted to become and, and stay a deity so that this would empower her and keep her in top shape. Further, she used these ruses in order to spread her essence to different planes in case she was ever defeated. Then she would survive, almost like a horcrux in Harry Potter. In Heliopolis, she had a lone lich that was connected to the real Tiamat through a form of psychic spell so that they could both communicate. This lich was imbued with the essence of Tiamat, so if her real body was somehow destroyed, she could actually assume existence in the lich. The reason for Dragon Eerie is a bit more interesting interesting though. Through deception, manipulation, and then using the body of said lich, she actually invaded Dragon Eerie in secret and silently murdered the dragon god Asarul, a dragon god of magic who was an old rival of Tiamat. She then secretly subsumed his essence, allowing her to create an avatar of Asarul and impersonate him. And nobody actually knew that it was her. It was through this newly gained avatar that she, in quotes, had a realm in Dragon Eerie. Now, in this spell plague, the realm of Dragon Eerie was completely destroyed, and this avatar that she had now obtained was unceremoniously teleported and yanked out and dropped randomly in a layer of Jahina. It was then that Bane took advantage and imprisoned this particular avatar of Tiamat. Bane, being the god of tyranny and control, basically tormented and tortured this avatar of Tiamat for a long time, and Tiamat played the part of the subdued prisoner until it was time to strike. To uh, keep the story short, this Asarul avatar that she had eventually escaped with a large modicum of power stolen from Bane and found its way to Avernus where the real body of Tiamat was. So in short, Tiamat only really has one dominion and that is Avernus. Everything else has either been a fictional story to sell to ignorant priests or some kind of plot in order to obtain more power. And it is thanks to all of that that Tiamat now possesses that extra avatar. Normally, Tiamat could only summon one single avatar, which kept her in check, but now that she had two, that allowed her to be a little bit more brazen in her schemes. See, now she had her normal avatar, which she could use to perform her duties in Avernus, and a second avatar, a battle avatar. Avatar that she could use to fight, while simultaneously keeping her real body safe in her lair. Okay, so now that we know that she is and has always been in Avernus, and that she has two fully functional and powerful avatars, what does she do in there? What does a queen of dragons do in hell? So unfortunately, the actual nature of why she's in hell in the first place is not really known. Mordenkainen in Tome of Foes says, quote, Tiamat is a force of chaos bound to a plane of law, end quote. For all intents and purposes, she has no reason being here, yet here she is. In fact, she has been here since essentially the inception of Dungeons and Dragons. She has been there and considered a fully fledged archdevil since first edition. It was then in first edition when we were told that she dominated the first layer of hell, Avernus, as the ruler of it. See, Avernus is the one layer where you really don't want to be, at least if you're a devil or a person fully living in the plane. And that is because because this being the very first layer is the place where most people that enter the realm will start in. And generally speaking, the people that want to come into hell are not the type of people that you want to interact with. To start, any demon that invades hell as part of the blood war will do so in Avernus, so constant strife is common in this place. This whole place is a big battlefield. Second, any devil that has displeased Asmodeus will be banished to Avernus, the first layer, so the place is filled with malcontents, failures, or people who might just want to betray the Lord of the Nine Hells. 
Thirdly, monsters from any plane that come to hell will first spawn here. So this is where you will actually find non-devil monsters like beholders, liches, and hags. So point is, Avernus is a little wild. So you need a strong leader to keep the masses in control and to protect the very entrance of hell. And that's what Tiamat was supposed to do. And surprisingly, she was actually really bad at it. Her main job was to keep the order and to eliminate those who seek to betray Asmodeus. But that is not particularly Tiamat's strong suit, and as such, she failed. And that's why she was demoted. Asmodeus, however, saw that this failure wasn't out of disloyalty, and as such, he allowed her to stay in Avernus and to have her own dominion within it. And so she did, and has been ever since. The start of this job seemingly came to be because of how strong she is. I mean, it, it doesn't really take long to realize back then who the real power was in Avernus. Everyone who entered could see she truly ruled the realm. I mean, look at her. But in the end, Asmodeus has absolute and ultimate power, and his word is final. The relationship between Asmodeus and Tiamat was actually always pretty good otherwise. Tiamat would occasionally bring him news of things that she would discover, and as a tremendous force to be reckoned with, she always helped with demons and insurrections that had to be dealt with in the first layer. Because of all of this, she was later formally given the position that she still holds to this day, which is the protector of the gate that connects the first layer and the second layer of hell. So if you want to get into the second layer of hell, you would have to pass through Tiamat. Now this is important because there is nothing in the first layer of hell other than explosions and people dying and war. The actual first mega city of hell is in the second layer, so you really want to be in the second layer, but to get there, you have to pass through the gatekeeper. So this job is actually huge. Now this, unlike being the Duke of Avernus, is actually right on Tiamat's wheelhouse. For all she has to do is just not let people through the bath and into the city of Dis. Now she uses her normal avatar that she always had to protect the gate permanently and she uses her new avatar, the avatar she gained by killing Azarul, to battle demons and correct insurrections in Avernus or to invade the prime material realm. Indeed, the Tiamat that you see at the end of Rise of Tiamat was confirmed to be that particular avatar. And now that it is destroyed, it means that Tiamat can no longer be a force around Avernus without either sacrificing her one job of protecting the gate to the second layer, or without putting her real body in harm's way, neither of which she would want to do. And this is why, if you were to find your way into Avernus, it is very likely that you wouldn't see her being particularly active anymore. Her battle avatar has been destroyed, after all. Now, the, the reason that she felt caged and shackled in Avernus came from a fortunate clash of minds that she had with the actual Duke of Avernus at the time, Bell, who was forewarned by Asmodeus to establish a firm control over her, imprisoning her in her kingdom in Avernus so that she, quote, doesn't get above herself and kindle personal ambitions, end quote. When Tiamat found this out, she became enraged. She felt betrayed, and now believes that all the Archdevils of the Nine Hells see her as a lesser being, as a, as a mere monster to be duped and exploited, as a prisoner. And now, determined to be caged nowhere and by no one, she reached out to her worshippers in the realms, which is why we see the events that transpired in the Tyranny of Dragons storyline. Now that she feels caged and duped by Asmodeus, She's trying to find a way out. I do want to point out, though, that one of the biggest reasons for Tiamat's anger really was a strong feeling of betrayal, for during her time in Avernus, she truly helped Asmodeus in as much as he could. Many people don't actually know, but the main weapon of Asmodeus, the, the famous Ruby Rod, was actually made with the help of Tiamat. But now, moving forward. With all of this being said, what does her realm in Avernus actually look like? How strong is she there? What, what are the sizes of her armies? Her lair resides in a massive mountain that is said to be filled with the bones of her enemies. Enormous, colossal bones that litter the bottom of the mountain. At the very top of this mountain, you would see a castle of immense proportions which she constructed magically out of molten lava and bones. Quote, 
although solid, the castle exterior walls appear to flow like lava and cause most creatures to avoid the place. The castle is an extension of the queen's personality. Its spires are twisted and grotesque. There are no windows and the walls are studded with bits of sharp material and jagged bones which can injure all but the most wary. The macabre yet impressive structure is avoided by nearly all the inhabitants of Avernus. The great evil dragon knows what is transpiring within every square inch of her castle and within many square miles beyond. Because of this, it is impossible to surprise her in her lair. Her treasure is vast and litters the castle. In some places, it is so thick she has shaped it into walls and uses it to cover the floor. Tiamat has a precise inventory of her wealth, down to each insignificant copper, and she has spent many decades mentally cataloging it so that she knows what all her magical items can do. She uses some of the items to further her malign gains. The Queen of Evil Dragons spends nearly all the time within her castle. She remains knowledgeable about what is transpiring on other worlds and planes through magical items, spies, and cults of humans and demi-humans that she has bent to her will. On rare occasions when something has sparked her interest enough for personal investigation, she dons a human or demi-human guise and takes one member of her court also disguised with her. End quote. The inside of her lair is filled with monsters and dragons, most of which spend their entire lives vying for her approval. Those that succeed in this enter her court, which is composed of five dragons, male dragons of each color, red, black, white, green, and blue. Quote, the court is handpicked by the queen based on their loyalty and the amount of gifts and services that they have provided. When a member of her court becomes too infirm, she takes the dragon to another plane, personally slays him, and immediately selects a replacement. Members of the court store their treasure within Tiamat's castle in separate chambers which are considered their own territories. End quote. It is with these male dragons in her court that she mates with, and when she does, the other four members of the court will form a ring around Tiamat and the one that she's mating with in order to protect them while they do it. When she does, she typically bears litters of one to four baby dragons after an average gestation period of only six days, which is, by the way, insane. As the mother of dragons, she can produce baby dragons extraordinarily narrowly fast. Rarely though, she will travel astrally to give birth to the litter in the prime material realm, sometimes at the behest of Asmodeus and sometimes to further some hidden plan of her own. Quote, those of Tiamat's offspring that are born and remain on Avernus occupy themselves with hunting down or bringing back food for Tiamat and her consorts while the chromatic dragon is in her lair. These offsprings are of all sizes, types, and ages of evil dragon kind and are all aggressive, cruel, and in good health. Injured, weak, or disobedient specimens are soon eaten by Tiamat or by others at her direction. She also dines on slain dragons including slain concerts who have displaced her, and all newborn spawn who are multi-headed or otherwise chromatic in nature. The few of her spawn that survive to achieve huge adult status serve as replacements for her consorts." End quote. This certainly gives you a very dark and grim view of the Queen of Dragons, not only readily eating her own brood, but also even letting her own children grow and then making them concerts that she will then reproduce with. It's particularly more grim when you realize that she doesn't actually need to eat for sustenance while she is in Avernus, which means she eats her own dragonflight for pleasure. Quote, Tiamat is capable of eating anything. On Avernus, she requires no sustenance, drawing her energy from the plane itself. However, when she travels to other worlds and planes, she feasts upon creatures that she defeats, molten objects and the very ground. Her favorite sustenance, however, is helpless creatures. She feeds upon their abject terror before swallowing them." End quote. So the question now becomes, why do dragons follow her? Who 
who is she to all these dragons? Tiamat is very interesting in that she's supposed to be the mother of evil dragonkind and a goddess to dragons, but dragons are not religious. I mean, for real, how often have you actually seen a dragon cleric? Probably ever. You do see silver dragons who are paladins of Bahamut, but chromatic dragons who are paladins or clerics? Not particularly. During the great war between the metallic dragons and the chromatic dragons a long time ago, dragons realized that serving gods who would allow such major wars to occur on their behalf wouldn't be gods worthy of being praised and as such, dragons just kind of became secular after that. I mean, I'm generalizing here, but basically. Dragons don't tend to pray to Tiamat, they do respect her and they do pay tribute to her and many do see her as the original creator of evil dragonkind, but most don't pray to her as one would pray to a god. This is from Races of Dragons, quote, All evil dragons pay homage to Tiamat. Green and blue dragons acknowledge her sovereignty the most readily. Many are proud to call themselves her spawn, able to trace their bloodlines back to their god. Good dragons have a healthy respect for Tiamat, though they try to avoid mentioning or thinking about her. Though most evil dragons honor Tiamat, few keep shrines dedicated to her in their lairs because they don't want Tiamat's greedy eyes gazing at their treasure hoards. Instead, they dedicate vast, gloomy caverns to their deity and keep them stuck with treasure and sacrifices. To commemorate a victory such as destroying a town, repulsing a thief seeking to pilfer from one's hoard, or gaining a great treasure, the followers of Tiamat celebrate by indulging in great wickedness, including torturing prisoners or even fighting one another to prove their supremacy." End quote. Tiamat is actually what you would consider a human god, ironically, because most of her servitors are actually human. This comes from Powers and Pantheons. Quote, Those who know of her are more likely to think of her as a powerful, legendary monster than a divine power. She is said to be the mother and or queen of the evil subspecies of dragons. Among dragons, Tiamat is traditionally considered a human goddess, worthy of respect and fear, but not worship. In in recent decades, a few chromatic dragons have joined her cult, but that is still relatively rare. End quote. For most of the history of the Forgotten Realms, Tiamat used to be a god in the Untheric Pantheon, a group of gods that served the region of Unther. In this region, she was well known as a god, but in the rest of Faerun, not particularly. People in Baldur's Gate, Waterdeep, and Neverwinter never really saw Tiamat as an actual god. In fact, if you were to ask them, they would have told you that she was probably just simply a powerful, legendary monster, but nothing more than that. This here is a crude map of how the religious boundaries between pantheons existed. Tiamat was a member of the pantheon that ruled this tiny region right here, which meant she could only give spells to those that existed within that tiny region. Attempting to open up churches in other regions would have gotten her not just in trouble with the other gods, but probably even killed. That's why nobody saw her as a god outside of that small area. You can also tell that Uptau has complete control over Cholt, by the way. That's just a fun fact. Anyways, many things happened in Unther that we don't have to talk about. All you need to know is that she grew at odds with her own pantheon and had many fights with Gilgiam, who was the leader of that pantheon. Through major schemes and multiple fights, she ended up actually defeating him and the pantheon eventually ended up dissolving. This is the moment when Tiamat decided that she was gonna go all in on getting as many followers as possible in order to become stronger. And this is the moment when she started to attempt to take over the Cult of the Dragon. And those of you who started playing in 5th edition might not know, but the Cult of the Dragon originally had nothing to do with Tiamat or, or any god for that matter. They were a completely secular group who only focused on transforming dragons into Draco Liches, and, and that's just what they did. They did worship and serve these Draco Liches, and Tiamat figured that she could get in on that. In order to fool the cultists, she actually created a new persona called the Undying One, which was an avatar of a five-headed Draco Lich, and using this persona, she seduced most of the cult into venerating her and into usurping the old leadership. Using this newfound veneration, Eo, the Overseer, allowed her to join the bigger roster of gods in the Faroonian pantheon, essentially granting her access to the whole continent. She continued on to vie for control of the Cult of the Dragon in order to get extra worshippers. 
She left a puppet leader in the region of Unther who further curtailed veneration towards her, and then she sawed destruction and chaos in the world using all of this newfound power. So going back to why dragons follow her, it is honestly strictly her power. I mean, she is a goddess, and her dominion is evil dragonflight after all. That means that whatever her power, it is at its strongest when dealing with evil dragonflight. If she makes a magic item using her divine essence, she has the ability to create powers for that magic item that deals with evil dragonflight. If she's going to cast a spell, it is at its strongest when it has something to do or it is used against evil dragonflight. Because evil dragonflight is her portfolio of divinity, she has power over it. Evil dragons simply fear her, and because of it, they pay tribute to her in whatever way they can, though mostly through monetary sacrifice. If Tiamat asks an evil dragon for something, that evil dragon has to do it lest it incurs her wrath. And that's basically the gist of it. Now, it is also believed that Tiamat has the power to charm evil dragons, but that's really seldom seen. The question would be now, could a heroic evil dragon who has had enough take her down and maybe even take her place? Probably not. Let's talk about our armies. So in the same way as gods do not use their sons, the Empyreans or the Titans, for combat in their armies, so doesn't Tiamat use dragons in hers. Gods use angels, and likewise Tiamat uses her devils. The armies of Tiamat are composed exclusively of what we call Abishai, which are Batesu devils completely under her servitude. Asmodeus could command them, but only by proxy, because Asmodeus rules over Tiamat, he has the authority to command them, but at the end of the day, they are Tiamat's brood, and she is the ultimate boss. Not that she would ever displease him openly anyways. According to Dragon Magazine number 75, Tiamat has three main generals who lead her armies. The first one is Duke Amducius, her skillful negotiator and mediator. This is the guy that you would probably meet if you wish to deal with Tiamat or make a trade with her of some form. Now he has three shapes, one of which is a yellow unicorn with eyes of flame and a purple horn, a hawk-headed man, or his favorite form, which is a wolf with a prehensile and constricting serpent's tail. He leads 29 companies of Avishai, which amount to roughly 2300 to 4300 units. The second duke is Malthus, who appears as a powerful, dark-complexioned man dressed in black velvet studded with gems. The velvet is of considerable value, for there are 333 gems in it, each worth around 100 gold pieces each. His other form is of a large crow-like bird. He leads a whole 40 companies of Avishai, which roughly amounts to 3,200 to over 6,000 units. Lastly, we have Gope, which is a pit fiend who leads three companies of Erinias, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, which amounts to roughly 240 to 450 units. According to the Fiendish Codex number 2, Malthus and Amducius are the only unique devils in the hierarchy of the Nine Hells that make their home in Avernus. That would be devils that are not the traditional cookie cutter line of devils. It makes them pretty unique. But this should give you a, a good understanding of her armies, though also keep in mind that this is just her offensive units that she uses as a military force. Her actual castle is, is also filled with dragons and consorts and all kinds of monsters. On top of that, she does have one current active avatar and one currently dead avatar, plus of course her, her actual real body, which would probably be even stronger than her avatars. You must also keep in mind that that is not just large numbers, but Avishai themselves are individually very strong. They come in chromatic colors, so you have red, blue, black, green, and white, and each of them serve a different purpose. Black Avishai are emissaries, blue Avishai are the spellcasters and the smartest, greens are the envoys. See, the, the black Avishais are usually sent more strictly for message deliveries or EC missions, where the greens are the real big diplomats with an expert sense of insight and persuasion. The red Avishai are the strongest in raw power and the best in leadership, and they possess Tiamat's power to bend dragons to their will. 
And then lastly, we have the White Abishai, which are the least powerful, but very useful in bolstering the ranks of Tiamat's armies because they fight with endless ferocity and without fear. Being a hybrid of dragonkind and devils, they possess great power. The, the red one, for example, has a challenge rating of 19, and the blue and green are not so far behind, with a respective CR of 17 and 15. They are strong, and Tiamat has thousands of them. The method of creating them is supposedly a secret only held by a few archdevils in Hell, secrets that Tiamat was more than happy to share for favors. This is probably because regardless of who creates them, they probably will still be loyal to her. Quote, each Avishai was once a mortal who somehow won Tiamat's favor before death and, as a reward, found its soul transformed into a hideous devil to serve at her pleasure in the Nine Hells." End quote. I'm, I'm sad that we don't really have the time to touch an Unther and the Church of Tiamat in here, because there's just a lot of interesting things about what the church does and what a cleric of Tiamat has to do in order to gain her blessing. They have Tiamat-related holidays and rituals and sermons, the whole thing. There's also a lot that Tiamat had to do in order to stay relevant and powerful while simultaneously dealing with Bahamut trying to kill her. And then there is, of course, the Chosen of Tiamat in Unther who rules as a king in the area, the, the CR-40 fiendish red dragon Chaza are, which we talked about in our list of the most powerful monsters in Dungeons and Dragons. I just do not have time to, to cover all of that, unfortunately, but what I will talk about are some of the spells that Tiamat can grant to her clerics, and spells that she herself can also use if needed. She can use and give a first level spell called Treasure Scent, a divination with only a verbal component that lasts for a round per level of the caster. This simple spell enables a priest to detect precious metals and gems within a 20 foot radius. The priest can determine the type of metal or gem as well as the total number of individual pieces, whether they be gems, nuggets or coins, but not the actual value of the treasure by means of this spell. When casting this spell, the priest must make repeated sniffing sounds as the verbal component. Tiamat requires that any priest employing this spell sacrifice 20% of any newly located treasure to her within 10 days of its discovery or face her wrath. We also have a fourth level spell called Dragon Scales. It needs a verbal component, somatic and material, with a duration of one turn per level. The spell creates a plating of dragon scales that grow from the priest's epidermis to cover all of the body except the head. The dragon scales give the priest a base AC of 4 and a plus 2 AC bonus. Now this is second edition D&D, so AC just sort of worked differently back then, but you get the gist of it. There were also two sixth level spells. The first one called Sleep of Dragons. This one's really cool. A charm spell with a touch range. By means of this spell, the spellcaster causes a being to fall into a deep slumber similar to the hibernating sleep of dragons. While in this state, the being does not require food, drink, or air and ages only a single year per century. This magical slumber can only be ended if the being is killed, dies of old age, a process that usually takes millennia, or is touched with a fragment of dragon bone, no matter how small. Dispel magic, remove curse, and such general remedies does not work. In addition, immunities and magical resistances to the common sleep spell do not work for sleep of dragons. It's a really cool spell. And then lastly, the other 6th level spell we have is Spawn of Tiamat, an alteration spell. By means of this spell, a priest can cause any of Tiamat's spawn, defined as any chromatic dragon, to grow a second head and neck for the duration of the incantation. Identical in appearance to the original head, the second head can bite once per round in addition to the dragon's normal attacks. Dragons cannot normally employ their breath weapons while making physical attacks, but by means of this spell only, a dragon can employ its breath weapon with the second head while attacking physically or casting spells with the original head and body. According to legend, the cult of Tiamat in Unther employed a 7th level variant of this spell, Lernaean Spawn of Tiamat, that imbued the second head with the properties exhibited by Lernaean Hydra. Also noted that some dragons themselves who worship Tiamat are reputedly able to cast a version of this spell using their draconic magic. 
The Lernaean Hydra is the Hydra that if you cut one of its heads, it grows two in its place. So presumably you would give this second head the same property as that, which is insane. Now, I did my best here not to spoil any of the adventures where Tiamat makes an appearance as difficult as it was. Otherwise, I, I might have added a few things here and there. This includes the, uh, the reason as to why the Gith use dragons, like you might have seen on the trailer for Baldur's Gate 3. I didn't want to really talk too much about that because I'm afraid that I might spoil something that would probably be a lot of fun to discover in the game so I just figured that you guys would appreciate that anyways. Whew, there you go. That was a long video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I would like to uh, ask once again, please, please, if you would like to support the channel, if you would like to support me, then please click on that link in the description below to check out Raid Shadow Legends and, and do the tutorial, uh, play through the game, and, and just enjoy it for me. Um, if we get the 430 referrals for it, um, the campaign would be successful, and if that happens, I we I promise you that I will make another 40-minute long video for you guys on whatever topic you, topic you guys want. Um, just leave me your suggestions in the description, and I'll try and make it happen for you guys. Please, please, please. I uh, it would really, really help me out if you guys help me with this promotion. But uh, yeah, other than that, I would like to personally thank my patron supporters: Rukado Fan, Zach Bowell, Walker Motley. Barry Mascant, 5e Magic Shop, Daniel Umar, Rusty Rain, Morgan Johnson, Biotechnofrag, Daniel Luna, Dog Feeder, Terry Culp, Baracus Law, Omega Scales, Karathas the Bulwark, Ozol, Soundtech, Ziri, Alex Cookson, Square Chicken, Ariel Nelson, Benjamin Bosters, Io is Awesome, Falky951, Jacob Krazid, Griffin Pierce, Ziran King, Brad Zalazar, Zabin Kurjab, Solarensis, Ordoric, Tesla Coil, Michael S. Yes. Prince Daylight Morning Crown, William Sladden, Drayden, Troll Skull Dude, Mr. Salty, Adam A, Silent Shoppa, The Role Playing Junkies Podcast, Thomas Hunt, and Jericho Darkstar for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you'd like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash Rex to support. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching, and for those of you who do play the game, uh, there will be a special thank you on the next video with your names and everything, so... Uh, please do that. <laughs> See you all next time. Bye-bye.